They call it the Bunny Man, or maybe Mothman, or the Jersey Devil. Maybe where you grew up, it was Walking Sam, or the Bus to Nowhere, or the Candy Lady. We're talking urban legends. What was the first one that scared the daylights out of you? We always have an odd one in the crowd. So it's kind of odd. Oh, decidedly odd. Doesn't that strike you as a little bit odd? No, that doesn't strike me as a little bit odd. It's the Bob and Sherry Oddcast. The stuff we wouldn't, couldn't, or shouldn't do on the regular show. Now, here's the Oddcast. Urban legends, you know, that's so interesting. It's such an interesting phenomenon because some of them just sound insane and impossible to be true. And others are just close enough to true that you believe in your heart of hearts that it definitely happened somewhere to somebody in some form or fashion. And that's how the story got told. And I know that people believe what they want to believe. Like, I'm not saying there's not a Bigfoot because I kind of think there's some sort of something out there. We've got so much tangible evidence and I can't tell you there's no Bunny Man or Mothman or Lobster Boy or Jersey Devil or Nicodemus or Caddy Wumpus or Candy Lady or Walking Sam. Because I think that there's a grain of truth. Maybe it started off just as a way to scare the kids and keep them out of the dark forest at night. Something happened somewhere back in time. So my question for you, Max and Doc and Lamar is, what was the first urban legend that you remember being completely convinced was real and having the snot scared straight out of you? Who wants to go first? I'll go first. I heard this story sitting out with my uncle. He was the first one to tell this story. We're sitting out in front of, we lived in a trailer in the yard of my uh, grandmother and grandfather. And so we're sitting out there, <clears throat> we got a little fire going and he starts telling some different things. And then he says, y'all know about the, the guy with the hook for a hand? And I'm like, oh. no. And so he told the story of the guy with a hook with a hand. He was a convicted murderer, rapist, terrible person. He's on death row. And it was on the news that he escaped from death row. And everybody needed to be on the lookout for this guy. So at the same time, this is going on in this small town. A guy was taking his girl out for a date, and he went and had dinner, and they went up to Lookout Point, and they was listening to some music, doing a little smooching and whatever, and they heard on the radio about the guy with the hook. And she's, like, freaking out. And he's like, no, oh, man, no problem. We're up here by ourselves. There's nobody around, whatever. And so, you know, he's thinking he's got the game, and, you know, they're on and on and on. And finally... They feel something sort of jar the car, like maybe a dog or something like that. Well, she just lost her mind. She says, get me home, get me home, get me home. He goes, oh, my gosh. So he cranks up the car and takes off, and he drives her home, and she's all crying and stuff. So he wants to be a real gentleman. So he gets out of the car, and he walks around to open her door to let her out. And hanging on the door handle was a bloody hook. And for the re I, I, my whole childhood, I kept looking for that guy with the bloody hook. One day I'm in the grocery store, and there's a guy that had lost his part of his arm or whatever, and he had a prosthetic hook. Oh, my God. I, I'm telling my mama, this guy's coming to kill me. I mean, it was, it was a traumatic deal. I, I, it took me a long time to get over the bloody hook. It really did. What do you think the purpose of that story is because that story for me like as a kid was a cautionary tale the way it was told to me by older family members was designed to keep me as a girl away from cars and boys and isolated don't places. be smooching with no boys in the car or you'll get murdered <laughs> that's exactly Thank you. right which Lamar, fairly um, accurate description of slasher films, right? Yes, what is the t yes. what is Friday the Thirteenth but a raging, bloodthirsty vendetta against teenagers who are sexually active? Like, yes, what is it exactly. but that, right? Ooh. It's a prophylactic movie. <laughs> Ooh, you know, I feel very sorry. It never occurred to me until you just told that story that people with a prosthetic hook 
were then looked at like you bloodthirsty oh, stalking yeah. murder. That's unfair. Yes. That seems yes. wrong to me. Yes. Ooh. So now I'm curious about Doc because of all of us, he seems to be the most emotionally and mentally stable, the person least given <laughs> to crazy drama, the person who you can count on in a crisis to come up with a solution and not run screaming into the night. So, I mean, Max and, and Lamar, do you disagree? Does that, is that not how <laughs> no, you think Sam, of Doc? No, no. if it hits the fan, I'm going, Doc, what do we do? Doc, what do we do? <laughs> <laughs> like, honestly, if right now a man with a bloody hook tapped on my door, I would text Doc and go, dude, there's a dude with a hook at my door. <laughs> what yeah. should I Tell do? Tell me what right? to do. That's right. Yeah. So how about you? Oh, sound and sane one. Was there a, an urban legend as a kid that really freaked you out? So the one that freaks me out the most is the one about Bloody Mary. And oh. I don't remember who told it to me or where it came from. But I remember this one time I was like, OK, I think I'm going to see if I can try to do this Bloody Mary thing and see what happens. So I go into to my bathroom at night turn the lights off and I'm staring. It's this gigantic, like very large size mirror that we had in our bathroom. So I say Bloody Mary once, I say Bloody Mary twice, and then I just got too scared and <laughs> turned the light on and ran out of there. That's Dude, why we trust have, you, Doc. I have that's so why. much respect for you. Yes. I, that's as far as I got with Bloody Mary. Because I thought to myself, um, it's kind of like, Lamar's take on this sort of thing which is very sensible and that is what the hell are you going to do if she appears <laughs> what? if you say it three times and she don't show up you still got nothing your pockets are still empty you got nothing you say it three times and she comes out of that mirror you got you a problem now I ain't doing it there's no payoff No, if it was like a million dollars and say it three times now we talk it but no, it's not. It's just me tempting fate. Oh, no, 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 no. I don't believe a word of it, but I'm not going to do it. That's just stupid. Well, and if, if she did appear, Doc, right, there wasn't, I don't remember getting the recipe for how to get rid of her. Do you? I don't. I'm, I'm not even sure what was supposed to happen, but I, I think she'd good. have to say her name three times. So you'd have to trick her into saying her name three times. I could be making this <gasps> up, but I don't know. Just saying. Oh, geez. Now we're working. Now it's a sounds job, like a, right? Sounds like a winner, though. Sounds like a so, winner. So one of the weird things that I kind of discovered um, is that apparently, you know, even though who, who knows whether or not Bloody Mary is actually real, but if you stare at a mirror in the dark long enough, apparently there's this phenomenon called strange face illusion where your brain starts to distort what it's seeing in the mirror. So you may very well start seeing things uh, that are kind of scary, even if they are there. Do you have to have the light off? Yeah, you've got. It's got to be. Uh, it's got to be a dimly light room or completely dark. See, I'm out and right I'm, now. I don't. I don't I'm, walk in a room until I reach in and turn the light on. I'm, <laughs> I'm just making myself a note because I don't. If I get up in the middle of the night to use the bathroom, I don't turn the light on. So, order chamber <laughs> pot from Amazon. Oh, yeah. I'm oh, sure yeah. they have have one at a good price. Um, are you guys familiar with the hitchhiker effect? Yeah. Have you ever heard of the phrase, uh, the hitchhiker yeah. effect? Doc, here's why we don't summon Bloody Mary, even if we did know a way to get rid of her. Because we might look in that mirror and say, Bloody Mary, Bloody Mary, Bloody Mary, three times, and nothing happens. And we go to bed that night feeling kind of silly. But then weird stuff starts going down. And we can't explain it stuff moves or it's missing there's a cold touch of a hand on your face while you're asleep but when you wake up you're alone in the room thumps and crashes and bangs lights maybe bloody mary came but not in the form you thought and once the hitchhiker effect tags on to you from what i understand it's just about impossible to shake mm -hmm. and that's why the only time I say Bloody Mary three times is when the bartender didn't hear me the first two. <laughs> you know, I'm starting Max, to be really glad. 
I was, I was, I was going to say, I'm starting to be very glad that my mother did not allow us to, my sisters and I, for some reason, we wanted to have a Ouija board growing up. And I'm glad, now I'm glad she didn't get it for us. Uh-huh. Dude, no. Me and my mama had are, one. Those are of the devil. Your it. mama had a Ouija board? She did. My brother was overseas. He was in the army in Korea. And so we're sitting there one night and she pulled out this Ouija board and she said, we're going to try to, you know, ask some questions. Was Troy okay? And all this kind of stuff. And so we, we both put her fingers on it and we're sitting there and I'm telling you, man, I'm terrified. I am terrified. So we ask it a question and it starts moving. And of course I'm accusing her of moving it. She's accusing me of moving it. I, I, I don't know. But I didn't like it. I wouldn't do it anymore. We did it once. I wouldn't do it anymore. Mm-mm. No, no, no. My, not for me. Not for me. I can remember when uh, one of my daughters was in middle school. She was having a sleepover and she was like, Mom, can we get a Ouija board? And I was like, you know what? No. And here's why. Because Mommy grew up in a family of spooky Sicilian witches who literally had seances and had psychics come over to do readings and read each other's tarot cards and, you know the works and I'm here to tell you you don't no you just don't want to invite forces in that you don't understand because guess what guess what you don't understand reality human beings our senses are weak sauce man we we are very limited in what we perceive and comprehend in the world all around us my cats have better eyesight and hearing than any of us right and If you're a person of faith, if you believe, listen, if you just think you're a walking, talking bag of meat, Godspeed. But if you believe in any other kind of spiritual realm, what the hell you do in opening a portal? I ask you, Lamar, what the hell you do in opening a portal? Oh, no, no. I told you, we we were at a movie the other day and they showed the previews for uh, the new Exorcist and Carla had her head down going, Jesus, 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 the whole time it was (laughs) over. I mean, I no, man, no, 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 no. You can't, man. I, look, whatever. Ever, if you watch a movie, the people that are on the Ouija board and all that stuff, they're idiots. You never see the smart guy. You never see the very intelligent guy do anything like. So, what do you got to gain from it? We're not going to get world domination by saying uh, Bloody Mary three times. We're not. It's not going to happen. Stop it. Just quit. Don't do I it. Just, I'm not doing it. I just think if you believe in an unseen yeah. spiritual realm. Don't kick open a dark portal. That seems no. like just basic life advice. So I'm glad that your that your family would not let you guys have a Ouija board, Doc. That's why you're so sensible, for God's sakes. Yeah. I grew up with witches. Look how I turned out, my friend. Did you want that for you? I don't think so. <laughs> Doc, Doc, you did want the Ouija board, though, didn't you? I did, and, you know, now I'm wondering, why, why was I stupid? <laughs> 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 Gosh, that's a whole other episode. Let me make a note. Why was I stupid? We'll hit that next Sounds week. Like Why? Something I but we say. know, we know that you're our captain. You, Doc, is our captain. Is. Whatever happens, we're looking to you to help us. Isn't yep. it crazy? Like the level of magical thinking. Like sometimes we'll have a technical problem, and I'll be like, "Oh, that's a demon in the machine." And then I think to myself, "Doc will get it out. <laughs> 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 He'll get that demon out." You bet he will. Let's get that demon out and he'll put it in the yard or something. How about you, Max? What was the first urban legend? So the first urban legend that I heard, and I always think what adds credence to these is whoever tells the story has a connection somehow to the person they heard it from. Mm -hmm. Well, my brother's friend's cousin said this really happened and swore that it was true. But this is the story of the vanishing hitchhiker where the girl is standing on the side of the road and she's in like a prom dress and they pick her up and she's kind of got a, a... flat affect about her and and they said well where are you going and she says I just want to go to uh, to my parents home and they they go to the parents home and they knock on the door and this woman answers your daughter we just picked her up on the road she doesn't feel and she said my daughter died 20 years ago going to prom in a car accident right (laughs) right 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 And and then they go back to the car and they're gone okay So that was the first one that I ever heard that I just totally bought and was really freaked out about. So I did a little research. There was actually a book about this that came out, I don't know, about 40 years ago or so. And so somebody sort of researched some stuff on it and found that that story went back to the 1870s. 
so it had been that long ago. Further research has shown that it went back much farther than that. Back to the 1600s in Sweden, there was a variation of this story. And kind of like with Bigfoot, there's a version of this story in England, Ethiopia, Korea, France, South Africa, Tsarist Russia, and of course, the United States, along with China. The Mormons have a version of this story as well. So it's, it's one of those things that for whatever reason seems like it comes over and over again and is one of these things that people have a tendency to believe, which is really fascinating. It either speaks to the fact that there really is something going on or this somehow hooks into a part of our human psyche. Well, if you like, let's um, let's benefit of the doubt, devil's advocate, right? Let's say that um, the people who say that ghosts are traces of energy that are left behind at places of extreme emotion. Well, a young girl being killed on her way to prom, that's pretty potent human energy. Right. That's going to leave a mark, yeah. right? And the grief that those parents feel, that grief is like a beacon strong human emotions in certain cosmologies and belief systems and whatever strong human emotions are beacons that call forces to them and what's what is stronger than love and what is love's expression in loss but grief so maybe the reason that we have the vanishing hitchhiker across every culture for eons is because there have been instances where that strength, that powerful beacon has called forth something. Mm -hmm. And we laugh about it now because we, we fancy ourselves as living in an age of reason. What do you now, think? Now, suppose the vanishing hitchhiker also had a bloody hook. <laughs> and would only come if you said their name three times, three times. in the mirror. So oh, I, I, there's, there's an urban, <laughs> there's an urban legend that freaked me out. Um, I love this kind of stuff, obviously, but there's an urban legend that freaked me out as a kid. Um, and it's very obscure. I think that a lot of people don't know this. It's, it's, um, centered in Philadelphia, which is obviously, you know, I was born there and lived there until my family moved out west when I was little. So, and my parents um, were also like Philly street kids. So this was the urban legend, ready? In Philadelphia, there's a bus, public transportation, SEPTA bus. It doesn't have an end destination, but of course you don't know that because one SEPTA bus looks like any other. And, if you're tired and it's the end of the work day and you're standing at your stop and the bus pulls up, you're going to get on, right? But this bus only picks up passengers that are having like maybe the worst time of their lives. Maybe they're very, very depressed. Maybe they feel hopeless. Maybe something has happened and they're just lost in grief and sorrow and they need an escape from their problems. And so they're out there on the street, you know, Walnut Street or Broad Street, whatever. And the bus pulls up and they get on board. And they stay on that bus until they're ready to face their life again, to face the world and all of the things that were holding them back. But the problem is some of those people who get on that bus disappear without a trace. Some of them were never seen again. Some of them were gone for weeks or months. Some of them were gone for years. But of course, for the riders on the bus to nowhere, no time passes at all. Mm. And what I like about this particular urban legend is it's shocking to me that an urban legend could come out of Philadelphia that's kind of cheerful because you'll notice that they're not eaten by alligators on this bus or fed to demons or burned alive in an eternal hell pit. They're just on a ride. Now, some people would say that um, a year-long ride on a SEPTA bus would be hell, but no, listen, 
the bus, it's an act of mercy. The bus picks you up when you can't take it anymore. And it stops and lets you off when you're ready to face the world again. That is about as nurturing and compassionate an urban legend as you can find. And Max, help me out here. The hell's it doing coming from Philly? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. So who knows, right? Who knows what's true and what isn't? I mean, people do disappear every day. And sometimes they're never, ever found. Where are those people? Did they get scooped up by the Mothman? Did they make the mistake of opening the door for the man with the bloody hook for a hand? Were they the ones who said Bloody Mary three times in the mirror only to have her actually arrive? Did they pick up the hitchhiker? Or are they on the bus to nowhere? Thanks for listening to the Bob and Terry Oddcast. So, so, so the girl was hitchhiking. <laughs> she had bloody hooks for earrings. That they, there you go. There, well, that's what happens when you try to pierce them yourself instead of going to the piercing pagoda. Hello. Common sense, everybody. <laughs> New episodes of the Oddcast every Monday. On Fridays, you can experience the mind-bending pleasure that is talking Lamar. And Friday nights, pull yourself up a seat around the campfire for true weird stuff. The podcast for the curiously morbid and the morbidly curious. We'd love to tell you a story. We'll see you next time on the Oddcast. <laughs>